May the words of my mouth and the meditations in our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. After the crucifixion and resurrection, Jesus' baptism is the next most important event in Jesus' ministry. In a magnificent epiphany, the Father and the Holy Spirit tear the heavens apart in order to proclaim Jesus to those who are present at this important event. The Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove to anoint Jesus as the Christ. The Father acknowledged and proclaimed Jesus as his beloved Son. This is a major event in the perfect life that Jesus led that makes it possible for human beings to become part of God's family as the adopted children of God. Jesus began his ministry in the womb of the Virgin Mary. There he took on our humanity. And even though he never sinned, he began to experience the pain and the curse of sin at that time. He endured the bloody pain of childbirth, just as we all do. He grew up in a world where work was just as frustrating as it is today. He endured the pain, the hardship, the frustration of sin, as we all do. Even though he never sinned, he carried the sin of the world for us from the very beginning of his existence as a human being. Up until the events of today's gospel, Jesus more or less carried out his ministry in a quiet, private way. A little more than 30 years has gone by since he took up our humanity. Nevertheless, we only know about a few events and people in his life. There's Mary and Joseph, the shepherds, Anna and Simeon, the Magi, and the teachers of the law who were astonished by his learning when he came to the temple at the age of 12. That's about all that the Bible tells us about the first 30 years of life as a human being for Jesus. It's really not very much when you consider who this is and what he has done for all humanity. Well, this all changed at his baptism. Jesus' ministry went from private to public in a big way. This was the beginning of a public ministry that would bring eternal comfort to some and incredible frustration to others. He brought hope to the hopeless and challenged those who were confident in themselves. Those who loved him, loved him more than life itself. Those who rejected him, hated him to the point of plotting against his life. Jesus' public ministry was very divisive. It divided the believers from the unbelievers. It separated the saved from the damned. The Father proclaimed, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. Those words remind me of the words that God spoke with Satan with regards to Job. It tells us, The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth. A blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. These words were a challenge to Satan. They were a proclamation of Job standing before God. A proclamation of Job's faithfulness. A proclamation that intensely frustrated Satan. In a similar way, the Father's proclamation at Jesus' baptism not only reaffirmed Jesus' identity as the Son of God, but it also proclaimed that here was the seed who would crush the serpent's head. The Father's proclamation at the baptism wasn't only an epiphany of the true nature of Jesus, but it was also a battle cry that this is the champion of mankind, the champion who would save all mankind from sin, death, and the power of the devil. The Father's proclamation at the baptism wasn't just an identification, but it was also a challenge, fighting words aimed at the devil. 
The devil has been challenging these words of the Father ever since. As we read through the Gospels, we see that the challenges, the temptations that opposition brought against Jesus all had a common theme. They all attacked the idea that Jesus really is the only begotten Son of God. In a few Sundays, when the season of Lent starts, we'll read the temptation that the devil brought against Jesus. Two of the temptations begin with the words, if you are the Son of God. The other temptation asks Jesus to worship the devil as God. All three temptations attack the identity of Jesus as God. The identity that the Father proclaimed at Jesus' birth and his baptism. Then there's that, tempta that temptation at the cross. As Jesus hung on the cross, those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Even as Jesus hung on the cross, the passers-by were still challenging the words that the Father proclaimed in this morning's Gospel. The attack on the Father's words was one of the major themes of the opposition against Jesus from the time of his baptism to his crucifixion. The Holy Spirit inspired John the Evangelist to write, The Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. Jesus' enemies simply rejected the words of God the Father that they are recorded in today's Gospel. Even today, there are people who admire Jesus as a great teacher, a good example to follow, maybe even a miracle worker. Nevertheless, they draw the line at the words of the Nicene Creed, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. They simply refuse to believe that Jesus Christ is God. They reject the proclamation that God the Father made at the baptism of Jesus. Why do people reject the proclamation of God the Father? They reject the Father's words because these words would mean that Jesus has authority. If Jesus really is God the Son, then he has authority over all things and all people. His words are the word of God. He's the judge and savior of all. As judge, he not only says that our sin is something that happens in our will, but it's not, in our behavior, not only in our behavior. Our very thoughts can be and often are sinful. The things that we do that seem to be in the world around us to be good can still be sinful in our heart if our heart's not in the right place. We help our neighbor not because we love our neighbor, but because we want other people to notice how awesome we are. In fact, if we ourselves notice that we're doing a good thing and pat ourselves on the back, we convert a good deed into sin. When Jesus judges us, he shows us that we're a lot more sinful than we think we are. As judge, Jesus also knows that our sins deserve punishment, both here on earth and forever in hell. He knows that we can't stand before the Lord on the last day if we're still in our sins. He knows that we'd be lost forever unless delivered from sin, death, and everlasting condemnation. Our sinful will is rightly terrified and most certainly doesn't like this teaching of Jesus as judge. As Savior, Jesus tells us that he's our only Savior. All others are false. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. As rebels, we want choices. We want ways that are more to our way of thinking. We want to be God 
and be in charge of our own salvation. Nevertheless, it's Jesus as our only Savior that has the most comfort for us. For not only does Jesus proclaim our guilt and punishment, but then he takes that guilt and punishment onto himself. Instead of pouring the wrath of God out onto us as we deserve, he takes the wrath of God unto himself. As the Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul to write, For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus took our sin to the cross, and there he endured the eternal punishment that we deserve. He endured that punishment so that we don't have to. In fact, it's in the very act of baptism that Jesus joins himself to us. As the Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul to write in today's epistle, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Here the Holy Spirit works through Paul to teach us that holy baptism delivers Jesus' work on the cross to us. Paul also teaches us that holy baptism delivers resurrection unto eternal life. For after Jesus, our judge and Savior, died for us on the cross, he broke the bonds of death and rose to new life. Holy baptism not only credits Jesus' death to our account, but the resurrection from the dead also belongs to us. Jesus, by his suffering and death, not only paid the full penalty for our sin, but he also earned eternal life for us. And today's gospel tells us that we're already with Jesus in his baptism. In proclaiming Jesus as his son, God the Father already proclaimed the victory that Jesus will win on the cross. Over, the victory over sin, death, and the power of the devil. He's already proclaiming eternal life through his beloved son. He's already proclaiming the victory that will win eternal life for us. Amen. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. We stand for the Tadeus.